We need to discuss to what degree is the brain made me do it defense actually transforming the criminal justice system. Hank, when you and I started talking about this a few years ago, uh, as, as well as uh, uh, Stephen Morse, who's taught me so much about the subject, we talked about that famous case from the early 90s uh, involving Spider Sistkoff. Mm -hmm. And this was the guy, Mr. Weinstein, who killed his wife by throwing her off their 12-story apartment building on uh, 72nd Street in New York uh, to make her murder uh, look like a suicide. And then at trial, he introduced a brain made me do it defense. He said that he had an arachnoid or spider-shaped cyst that was, uh, s uh, was around his amygdala. And this uh, made his impulse control dramatically lessen. The judge considered the evidence and came up with a Solomonic solution. He allowed the jury to hear evidence that Mr. Weinstein had an arachnoid cyst, but not that there was a correlation between the cyst and violence. And since then, I gather, this evidence has been most likely to come in in death penalty trials, given the relaxed evidentiary standard. So the defense introduces a brain maybe do a defense. The prosecution counters. But it's not clear that it's actually had much of an effect on jurors. So I want to begin by asking both of you, to what degree is this evidence coming in, and how influential is it? And this, the spider Siskoff case, Weisskopf case, is really kind of an interesting example. The judge made that Solomonic decision. But what happened next? They copped a plea. The prosecution, knowing that this evidence was going to be introduced, then offered a reduced a plea to a lesser included offense, which the defense took. And we don't really know how often this is happening. We've made a few stabs at it. Various people have. Anita Farahani, who's a professor now at Duke Law School, has been collecting reported decisions involving neuroscience and criminal cases. Uh, but she's found an increasing number of cases in which neuroimaging evidence has been discussed in these appeals. I think the, the lesson here is, is, is the science panel is talking about is, is the legal system and some of the tragedies you read about there really underscore the importance of trying to use this, this new science for prevention. Um, not to put people in jail, not to pu punish them for having these tendencies, but to try and prevent them from occurring. And then, you know, even on the, on the people who did it side, I remember I talked to the, um, the lawyer for Jeff Landrigan. So he was a guy who was adopted at a young age and uh, had a horrible upbringing. And, and he made this claim that he has this murder gene. He didn't use it in that, that, that wording, but he made this claim and it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and in talking to his lawyer, um, it's clear he, his entire life was, was ruined by this reaction he had. Whenever he got frustrated or really put upon, he just flashed out really violently. And uh, he committed two murders, both where he basically was sort of provoked and he just lost control. He would do it with the, the judge and the cases. He would do it with his own lawyer. And he now recognizes it. He, he, he would, he's now executed, but he, before he was, he, he would recognize this. I, he, I just did it again, he'd say. And uh, his lawyer is saying, you know, there's something just wrong with him metabolically that probably could have been uh, treated with some kind of drug or some way that could have been controlled. And his life wouldn't have been ruined, and, the, and the, the people he killed wouldn't have been ruined. And you look at these stories over and over in our criminal justice system and say, if we could have prevented this, there's so much suffering that could have been prevented. Um, you know, surely we can try and do better. And, and you know, the problem was we never had any markers, really, any, any uh, factors to show that there is a risk. And now the work that Ken and other people are doing, we're now starting to get some suggestive evidence that we can maybe identify risks. Again, the great news is it's not deterministic. It doesn't mean they will do this. It means they're at a greater risk. And so. Now that we have that, the question is, can we pair that when, with treatments? And it seems only really worth doing this if we can pair it with treatments. But if we can put some resources into finding these treatments and making them work, we can maybe prevent some of these horrible cases from actually occurring. 